Praise God. This is our anniversary year. We've got two anniversaries <clears throat> in uh, Scotland. We have been back there 30 years. We planted a church there 30 years ago, and we just celebrated that in February. And this is our 50th wedding anniversary this year. And uh, so we've got two big anniversaries in one year. Isn't that awesome? Uh, so... He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Amen. Uh, <laughs> and beside every great man, there's a great woman and a surprise mother-in-law. <laughs> so, so we're blessed. Uh, this morning, uh, I want, to, oh, just one other thing. I, no, I noticed in your, and this is not, I'm not picking you out in this or anything, but they, all, they also have Healing Jesus TV. And Healing Jesus TV, you get it on your computer. Uh, there's some fantastic speakers. There's some awesome things on Healing Jesus TV. And uh, you get a lot of the, well, all the, all the campaigns are live when they're doing live campaigns. Uh, so there's so many things that you can watch live on Healing Jesus TV. Uh, you know, I think that uh, through meeting Pastor Bill uh, and Kat uh, all those years ago, I've always believed that increase comes through association. Well, Proverbs 13 says that increase comes through association. So if you want to increase, you've got to be associated with the right people. You can't always be around people that's asking you questions. You've got to be around people that you're asking them questions so that you can grow and increase in the things that God wants you to grow in. And I think that's what, this is a place of increase. You've come to a place of increase. This isn't just church on a Sunday. We come here and we just say, okay, the same old, same old. No, it's a place of increase. When you open your heart, open your mind to receive, you will increase. Uh, and there's, there, there's a, this, this is an atmosphere in here. There's an atmosphere of faith. There's an atmosphere for miracles. Uh, there's an atmosphere for uh, greatness in this place. Amen. When you think of all these uh, intellectual assets that you're seated beside, touch your neighbor and say, you're one of those. You're an intellectual asset in the kingdom of God. Can you imagine, can you imagine, and, and, and you know, I, I'm kind of going off my notes and things like that, but in Genesis 11, 6, it talks about uh, the, the Tower of Babel and how the people got together in, with, in vision and unity and all communicated the same thing. And that was one time when God had to leave heaven and come down to earth. He says, because these pe for these people, nothing can be impossible. Because they said the same, same thing, they saw the same thing, and they communicated in their uh, congregation together amongst the people. Once you do that, for businessmen and businesswomen, if you get your business on that same level where people can see what they're going for, you will build the biggest business you can build. You gotta expand, you gotta dream big dreams. Uh, Ephesians 3.20 says that God will give you super abundantly far over and above all that you can dare ask, think, dream, or imagine. How many of you are living in that place where you're receiving more? Or how many of you are even pushing out your imaginations? We've got to go to a new level in our imagination. I like to break that word down, image a nation. You know, we can image a nation serving God. Uh, Bishop Dag Heward Mill started off with 600 people. I was at this first campaign that had 500,000 people. From 600 to 500,000, imagination. If, you're imag if, if anything this morning, my mandate here is to excite your imagination. 
is sight your thinking. Think outside of the box. Think bigger than you've ever thought before. And see yourself in the picture. You can do great things. I, I, my wife and I, we came from small uh, towns, small villages in Scotland. Uh, we are the first in our families that have done many, many, many things. Uh, and I have a big family. My mum just celebrated her 89th birthday and uh, there was 106 of us there. That's directly from my mum. She had 10 children and that's the grandchildren and great-grandchildren and, and spouses. But there was 10 people couldn't make it and she's just had another child. There's been another child added since then. So we're prolific. But uh, we were the first to be born again. We were the first in many different areas in, in our life. Go and be the first at something. Yeah. Amen. Dare to be the first at something. Ah, uh, you know, if I was younger, I would do that. <laughs> if I had more money, I would do that. If I was better educated, I would do that. No. All you need to do is do it. Yeah. Amen. Just my, the message title that I have. And, you know, I came here not with a canned message. I, I don't know if you know what a canned message means. Uh, one that's been preached a hundred times before. Uh, no, I, I came here with a message from the Holy Ghost, which I believe is a message for this church at this time and, and, and for you. And, and it's providential that I'm here in this time for you. Amen. And the, the, the title of my message is The Propelling Power of Purpose. The Propelling Power of Purpose. When you understand your purpose, you will be propelled into the future. And, and listen, this is for everybody. For everybody. I could cite examples of, of senior citizens that have uh, been propelled out of mediocrity into a place of uh, not notoriety because they've dared to believe in their purpose. Amen, church. Uh, uh, this is a message for young people and old alike because God doesn't, how many of you get up in, uh, in the morning and you think oh, it's the same old, same old? No, you know, my mom's 89 years old. She, ha she went out and bought a treadmill uh, th this year. <laughs> I go to, I'm, I'm her power of attorney, and I go into the house, and I see a treadmill. And I said, Mom, where'd you get the treadmill? Did someone give it to you? No, I went and bought it. I said, how'd you get it here? She says, I got them to deliver it. I said, well, what are you doing with it? She says, well, I go on it for 15 minutes, and then I go and do my housework, and then I go on it again for fit. So she does an hour a day on that, and then <clears throat> she goes to chai tea, I mean Thai chai. Once a week, she goes to Tai Chi uh, at 89 years old, and then she still fits in a gym session at the local gym. You see, you might be old, uh, older, but you're not old. So she is just going to be young forever. Do you know what I'm saying? So uh, when you understand your purpose and your potential, you'll start to do things that you've never done before. You'll go places you've never gone before. You'll see things you've never seen before because you opened your eyes to the potential that God has put in your life. Can I hear a great amen? amen. <laughs> Thank you. So Acts 9, I'd like us to go there. Acts 9, chapter 4 from the New King James Bible. And this is the story of Paul as he was on his fulfilling what he thought was his purpose at the time to capture Christians and, uh, and stop the growth of Christianity in the world at that time. So we, 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 we read from verse four, then he fell to the ground after seeing this great light and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? These are, th these are two questions that Paul asked. The first is, who are you, Lord? And, and many of us need to ask, who are you, Lord? You see, 
when, when, when some people make, find out who the Lord is, we make him Lord of all. And to us, when my wife and I came to know Jesus, we made him Lord of all. He was Lord of every area of our life, Lord of our finances, Lord of our marriage, Lord of everything. Amen. Who are you, Lord? And uh, Then the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. So he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. So his second question is, I realize that you are Lord. Now, what do you want me to do? There must be something that I can do for you. Now you've introduced yourself to me. What can I do for you? And my wife and I, as young uh, business people, uh, we came to know Jesus. I, I, that was 1980. I was 30 at the time. And uh, we came to know Jesus. And uh, immediately we started working for Jesus. A few weeks after we... Uh, I got promoted with uh, the company I was with at the time was Thorn EMI, and they moved me to a city 100 uh, kilometers away, and we were driving back and forward to church on a Sunday till one day I said to the pastor, we can't keep doing this, what can we do? And he said, start a church. <clears throat> and my wife and I, only six weeks in the Lord, said, well, how do we do that? He said, well, just put an advert in the paper. So we put an advert in the paper, Bible studies, home group, come to our house, we'll teach you the Bible. We only had two books. We had two books by Kenneth Hagin that was 26 Lessons in Prayer and 26 Lessons in Faith. And I thought, sorted. Uh, as a, that's a year already. Uh, so we, we, we took those books and uh, we would, I would just read verbatim from those books. And uh, one, one time this guy came and uh, <clears throat> he starts arguing with me in the house about the theology of these books. And I didn't know what theology was. So it was in the winter and he had this parka coat on. And uh, so I was still in my diapers. Uh, so I got him by the scruff of the neck and I marched him out the door and I put him outside and I said, don't you dare come back here because uh, that was my old man resurrecting itself. <laughs> so a few weeks later, he comes back and apologizes uh, for his behavior uh, to find out that he was an ordained AOG minister. <laughs> but, but you see, the foolish things of the, uh, the world confound the wise sometimes. And God will use you, whatever you are. So anyway, him and I became the best of friends. And he took over in that church when we left there. It's a great church and it's going strong. But the point is, we asked, what do you want me to do? When you ask God, what do you want me to do? He will tell you. And he has told us the whole Bible is full of instruction for us. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it. If it's polishing this pulpit or whatever, whatever you're told to do, just do it. Amen. And God will bless you as you go and do these things. So uh, verse 15, the, Paul goes into the city and God speaks to Ananias and says, uh, I want you to go and speak to Saul. But Ananias says, do you know who you're talking about here? You're talking about someone that kills Christians. I'm a Christian. You want me to go and speak to him? So anyway, the Lord says, go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the king, the kings as well as to the people of Israel. You see, we've got to ask ourselves the question, why on earth am I here? What's my purpose on earth? Am I just here uh, to be part of a conflagration of people in this world? Or am I here for some important uh, purpose? And the answer is you're here for a purpose. You, and until you find out your purpose, you'll, you'll go around in ever decreasing circles. Uh, uh, one lesson, uh, Miles Monroe said this, 
anyone not fully being who they are created to be is abusing themselves and wasting their potential. So if you're not doing what you were created to do, you're abusing yourself and wasting your potential. We need to fulfill that potential we've got. We've got to be, uh, we, are, we are potent with potential. But many of us are, are impotent and we're not using the potential that God has given us. Um, uh, everything that has a purpose doesn't mean that the purpose is known. And uh, the major reason for this is that purpose doesn't reside in a thing. It can only be found in the manufacturer or the designer of the thing. So if you want to know what your purpose is, you've got to go to the creator and ask him what he created you for. Uh, you see, uh, I used the illustration this morning that this microphone would make a great hammer. It would make a great knob carry. It'd be great for silence, silencing some anything. <laughs> It would be great for hammering in nails, but it wasn't designed for that. The purpose that it was created for was for amplification of our voices. So everything uh, goes back to the designer. Amen. So the machine doesn't know what it was made for, but when we know the, 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 the purpose for a thing, we'll use that uh, and not abuse that. Uh, I, I know the purpose for my wife. So I use my wife the way God meant for me to use a wife. And uh, uh, wives and husbands and ha your children, what purpose are you giving children for? We know the purpose of grandchildren. The purpose of grandchildren is a gift from God so that because we never killed our children. <laughs> so so we, there's a purpose in life for everything and we've got to find that purpose, Amen. Uh, one, 2 Timothy 1.9 says this, who, save, who has saved us and called us with a holy, a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose. And I've added this determination and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. God gives us a seed principle in Genesis 1. And uh, those, the, the seed is, is determined, is determined. He determined from the beginning of time that an apple seed would produce apple trees, orange seeds, but the, everything grows in its own environment. And uh, we, we've got to uh, understand that uh, genealogists and biologists have tried to change the, a seed and the, the determination of a seed, but the determination of a seed can never be changed. And according to God, we are called and determined before time began that we, he has determined our purpose and, uh, and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. So we have a determination. There is an end, there is an end plan, an end picture for every one of our lives. Uh, that end picture might not be clear to you, but through a series of providence, God will bring you to the place where your end will be recognized. I never thought that I would ever minister to people, but God, through a series of circumstances in my life, brought me to a place. I didn't think uh, when we were, start, I never thought we'd start a church in our house. We've started three in the house. Uh, I've never thought we could do that and still do business at the same time. Uh, but God used that providentially for the increase uh, of his kingdom and for his glory. Amen. Uh, you know, we, we, we've been reading uh, through Romans 12, uh, 3 to 8, but one of the things God did for us was to, make, uh, uh, to, to give us the gift of giving. And, uh, and when God talks about that in Romans, he talks about giving with all liberality. So for us, it becomes a joy to give. And, and when you're in business, you know, it's, it's like, 
um, to give 10 cents out of a dollar is easy. To give a dollar out of 10 is easy. But when you get a uh, 100,000 to give 10,000, you think, oh, not so easy. But if you've been giving with liberality and joyfully from a dollar, you can give joyfully from a 100,000 or a million. Amen. Uh, but if God's given you that gift, he will also give you the source. He will also, Deuteronomy 8, 18 says that he is the one that will give you power to create wealth. Amen. So he's given you the ability to create wealth so that his kingdom can be established. Amen. That God does all that providentially because he puts you in a place because he knows that you're seeking his purpose and that you will do his purpose. Amen. So it's providential. Uh, Romans 8, 28 says this. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. So you're called according to his part. Every one of you, God put you in a place today. He put you in this place today so that you could hear this word, so that this word would ignite in you something that's been lying dormant. Maybe you haven't come to a place of receiving Jesus Christ into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. Maybe you've thought, well, I don't need to do that because I know who God is and I read my Bible. But no, the only way that you can go further in Christ is to become part of his forever family and ask Jesus into your life as your personal Lord and Savior. When you ask Jesus in to your life as your personal Lord and Savior, it's the ignition switch. It's the uh, launching pad for everything that he wants to give you. Are you with me, church? That's where he wants, to, he wants you to come to that place and he's got you in a place and that's what he did with me. I was anti-Christ before January 1980. And I met, I, I went into a church one day after the second or third time. I, I'm, I thought, this is real and I made Jesus my Lord and Savior. The next year he put us into business. We went into our own business and uh, the, the, we, we, in that year we made the equivalent of two million dollars. My wife and I working together, uh, me on the road and her at home on the telephone. That's quite a lot of money. But that was far beyond all we could dare ask or think. But the ignition was me making Jesus the person, my personal Lord and Savior. Do you get it? Nod your head if you, you get it. Shake it if you don't get it. <laughs> this is what happens. You know, I think you need real life examples that you can say, well, if he can do it, God's no respect for persons, then I can do that as well. That's what we need. We need to be somebody to say, if, you can, if he can do it, I can do it. God's no... He's providentially put you in a place today so that you would hear something that would change your life irrevocably forever. Amen. So I just want to, uh, I want, they've got lots of uh, examples that I could use, but uh, let me use the, the example of, of Jonah. Jonah had a purpose. And uh, when, when, in, in Jonah 1, it says, the Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amita. Uh, get up and go. There's that again. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have, I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. Why me, Lord? Why are you calling me, Lord? It's like uh, some of the places I've been in the world, you think, Lord Almighty, how did I get to this place? And, and you know, I've slept in, pat, in planks and, and a wooden uh, 
structure with tin sheets. Uh, I've preached in, in churches with mud walls only this high and just palm trees around about and uh, no floor. It, some of the things, uh, the sights I've seen, the smells that I've been involved in and things, and the food that I've eaten in some of the places, you, it's beyond imagination. But thank God, he says that we shall eat deadly things and they shall not, by no means harm us. Uh, that's when you know you're walking in faith. Uh, so if God had told me, and he did two and a half years uh, before we moved back from South Africa, he said, we're, we're going, you're going back home to Scotland to minister the word there. I said, no, not until you speak clearly to me. And in December the 6th, 1986, I went back to Berlin. I did a big deal in Berlin and I went home to see my parents and uh, I walked into a mall on a Saturday morning uh, that you, you remember that December the 6th, 1986 was a Saturday. And uh, at 11 o'clock, you do, <laughs> at 11 a.m. in the morning, I turned this corner, corner <clears throat> and immediately the Holy Spirit showed me the de desperate need of the people in Scotland. As I saw that, I, I heard the voice speaking the way I'm speaking right now. You're coming back. And at that moment in time, a series of events unfolded. That same day, God took me to see a house through my sister-in-law. And I didn't want to go there, but as I set my foot on the threshold of the house, the Holy Spirit spoke to me again. And he says, I'm giving you the strategy to buy this house. At nine o'clock tonight, you phone this man and give him the price. Tell him you're putting the phone down immediately and not to say anything. At nine o'clock Sunday morning, phone him back for the acceptance of the offer. This is quite radical. So I go look at the house. My wife didn't know either. She was in Africa, I was in Scotland. So... I go there, the Holy Spirit gives me a price at nine o'clock that night. I phone the guy, he says, yeah. I says, this is the price. And all I hear is, <gasps> and I put the phone down, <laughs> just being obedient. So at nine o'clock the next morning, I, I phone the guy back up and he says, I can't take that. I need two and a half thousand pounds more. So I said, okay, if you leave all the furniture, everything except your personal belongings, I'll give you the two and a half thousand pounds. Monday morning at nine o'clock, I went to the bank, 9.30, I had the mortgage. You see, God has a perfect timing for everything. And when you get into his plan, he'll open doors for you. He will speak to you. He'll direct you every step of the way. Some of you don't move, but it's like Jonah, get up and go. Get up and go. I've got a word for you. Straight from the throne of heaven. Get up and go. Some of us, our get up and go has got up and went. <laughs> and we've tried to catch up. No, I'm telling you, when you enter into this place with the Lord... You enter into the greatest adventure you've ever entered into. So, <clears throat> but here's the good news. Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board hoping to escape the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. Now, going in the opposite direction can be expensive. It costs Jonah God's purpose and God has a purpose for our life. Every time we rebel against God's will, we will lose. God's purpose for Jonah was that he go to Nineveh. Jonah rebelled and lost. However, if we repent and change direction and turn around, God will still forgive and restore us. 
Amen. God will, no matter where you are today, the good news is God will forgive you and will restore you. Uh, you've, you've omitted to do some of the things God has called you to do. You've omitted to go places God has told you to go. You'll have an exciting time when you're standing in line and God says, pay for the groceries for the person behind you. Or you're on a, in a, a restaurant and God says, pay for those meals for those people. You, you move into another area of life, which is an excitement. Uh, uh, it's, I tell you what, it, bring, it brings a, a, a revival of passion and zeal in your life and a love for people. I mean, <laughs> it's a love that's poured into your heart that you can't really get any other way. And, uh, you know, I just want, I want us to think about that for a moment, to make life-changing decisions. You know, life-changing decisions should never be made based on your present emotions. Don't make a life-changing decision based on present emotions, but make a life-changing decision based on a prayerful time with the Lord. As you wait on him, he will direct your paths. And I, I just want to uh, close by saying this, that um, in all of my life, I've always just done what I knew God wanted me to do. And I've never had that place where, Lord, Lord, I need a word from you. I, I can't go and do anything until I get a word from you, you know, Lord? And it's paralysis through analysis, and you're, you're just like, I, I, I can't do it, Lord. I mean, you know, I really need confirmation from uh, two or three men or women and angels and prophets, and, and, and I, I, need, I need to see a cloud formation and, and all of that. No, the, God's will is that you go doing what he has told you to do. And if you're on the wrong road, he'll say, you'll hear a voice from behind you saying, hey, this is the way, walk ye in it. Don't turn to the left or to the right, but walk this way. And all it takes is us, in Proverbs 16, it says, roll your works upon the Lord. Commit your ways to him, and he will cause your thoughts to become as his thoughts. When your thoughts become as his thoughts, then you go with confidence. Christian, you go with confidence in the Lord. We should be the most confident people in the world. Because Christ is in us, leading us, guiding us. He sent his spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. He sent us his spirit as the helper. And that's why we have to go because the Holy Spirit can't help you if you're, if, if you're standing still. You need to be moving. Amen.